<laughs> Little known fact. All right, so let's get uh, going on today's class. So what we're going to do today is uh, we're going to uh, set up what we're going to be doing for the next uh, um, multiple weeks. So what we're what phase we're in right now? We're in the phase where uh, you're doing a lot of background uh, research. You're doing a lot of background reading. You're kind of delving into different areas to try to answer your uh, your research question. And uh, that's going to take some time to kind of pull in all of these resources, but you should be underway. You should have some articles under your belt, uh, some areas that you've already looked into. So what we're going to do over the next uh, series of weeks is we're going to give everybody an opportunity to share that knowledge with the rest of the class and kind of build up this uh, sort of community of shared knowledge because of two things. Number one, uh, the presentations that you watch might give you an insight, might give you an idea uh, about your own project. So maybe taking a look at something from somebody else's perspective uh, or a finding that they found uh, is going to impact the research that you're doing. And then the other thing is that one of the projects uh, in this class is to eventually present your research in a conference type presentation. And uh, it's good to have some practice doing that before you have to do your final project. So it'll also work towards uh, a sort of practice run for some of these conference type uh, presentations. So what we're gonna do today is I'm gonna give you a sample of what uh, your presentation will be like, and then uh, we will go through some specific criteria about uh, what is expected of these upcoming presentations. So you'll see one uh, that will become part of your shared uh, knowledge, and then uh, I, will def I will go through kind of point by point, this is what you want to do in each presentation, this is what we're going to be looking for, this is what you're going to be graded on, uh, so that you can do the best job uh, possible. All right, so the first thing to mention before we delve into the, um, uh, to the sample presentation is that each presentation is going to be on uh, a single article. So you have been gathering a whole bunch of research. You can choose whatever article you want. It might be one that is very important for your uh, research project. It might be like a key article that uh, you found very useful. It might be one that you just find uh, very interesting. Uh, it can be chosen for whatever reason that you want, but you will present that article to class. So the goal of the presentation is for you to sit up here and much like the article Aladdin Sane and Close Up I Asymmetry, David Bowie's contribution to comic book visual language, you will give a summary of that article so that in 20 minutes your audience can understand what that article was about, what was done, and what was the basic point. So that's the first thing to know. It's not a synthesis of your project yet, we're not quite there. It's just a single article that you have used for your research project and you're just gonna tell the class about it to kind of get the ball rolling. All right, so let's uh, jump into this uh, sample, uh, sample presentation. So the presentations are gonna be short, they're gonna be approximately 15 to 20 minutes each, so I'll see if I can do that on this one. And this is uh, Aladdin Sane and Close-Up Eye Symmetry. David Bowie's contribution to comic book visual language. So uh, what we're gonna learn about uh, today is close-up eye asymmetry. So here is a nice example of close-up eye asymmetry. And this is a metaphor that is used in visual language. So this close-up aspect of it and this eye asymmetry here with the, uh, with the lightning bolt, these are both metaphorical pieces of information that are communicating something to, uh, to the viewer. And what we're gonna do uh, in this paper is we're going to make the argument that number one, uh, close-up eye asymmetry QA is a metaphorical device that communicates two different ideas, uh, the idea of the alien and the idea of the human. And then we're gonna make the argument that QA is a lexical item in comic book visual language. It is a uh, piece of comic book visual language, something that's part of the way that we communicate with visuals, at the very least, in comic books. And then uh, we'll finish with an argument that uh, this metaphorical device of close-up eye asymmetry became part of our visual language due specifically to the cover image for Aladdin Sane, uh, this cover image right here. So let's introduce the idea of close-up eye asymmetry. 
So what is it? It is, uh, first off, close up. That is the first part of it, is the close up part. And what this is saying is that the person is like the viewer. So close personal distance is a metaphor in visual language that communicates that the person that is close up is like you. The fact that they're close uh, indicates that they are actually like you. So uh, in um, previous research, this is coded as the person is human rather than alien, like you rather than something that is unlike you. So the close-up aspect of this picture communicates that Alain and Sane over here is something that is like us, like the viewer. However, the asymmetry communicates that this person is unlike the viewer, it's unlike you. So this asymmetry around the eye, this asymmetrical placement of the makeup, that communicates that uh, this is actually alien and not human. So in this one combination, we have these two disparate and competing ideas that this is human and not human. This is like us, but not like us. And that is a communication, uh, that, that is the idea that's being communicated in close-up eye asymmetry. So again, it's the idea that this person here is human and at the same time uh, alien. This person is human, is like us, and at the same time is not like us. So that is the idea that it communicates both alien and human. And then the next point uh, that we'll argue is that it actually is a lexical item in comic book visual language. And the way that you can show that it's a lexical item in comic book visual language is to show that it is used in the communication form of comic book art. So simply by finding it recurring, uh, recurring instances of this metaphorical device, would indicate that it is actually a mode of communication that is used in comic book visual language. So here we have an example that is not close-up eye asymmetry, and this is Peter Stanchik from the comic book Harbinger, and he has very strong psychic powers, as you can see here, but this is not close-up eye asymmetry, uh, close-up eye asymmetry, it's not close-up, and there's no asymmetry around the eyes. However, this is close-up eye asymmetry. So this would be an example of that lexical device of close-up eye asymmetry being used in comic book visual language. And here's another one on the cover at X-Men Nation X. And here's another one with close-up eye asymmetry. So you could do it either with the portrayal of powers, you can do it with shading, you can do it with the placement of objects, and some of you might say, well, is this really close-up eye asymmetry because that's the way that you use a camera. You need to cover one eye when you're using a camera. And that might be true for the camera, but it's definitely not true for the skull. You do not use a skull like this. That skull has been placed intentionally to uh, create this metaphor of close-up eye asymmetry. And then you can also see it in various forms of composition. Uh, such as in Preacher, in Hawkeye and the Winter Soldier, where we have Hawkeye's face and we have this very distinct asymmetrical shadow over the one eye, and then with the placement of Witchblade over Lara Croft only on the one side. So it does occur over and over again in comic book visual language, and more so than that, it's also known to comic book artists. So for example, this is Cable, yet another example of close-up, I asymmetry, and uh, Cable's uh, design was, uh, he was designed by Rob Liefeld, and a lot of people like Cable's design, but Alex Ross is not one of them, and Alex Ross is another comic book uh, artist, and in an interview, he said the design of Cable, I hate it, but importantly for us, he said that the scars, the thing going on with his eye, the arm, and what's with all the guns. So that thing going on with his eye is evidence that comic book artists are aware of this device. They are aware of its use. They are aware of its existence. It is a lexical item in their visual language. All right, and then the last piece of this puzzle uh, is to argue that comic, uh, sorry, um, close-up eye asymmetry became a lexical item uh, in comic book visual language, specifically due to the cover of Aladdin Sane. So you can trace it back to that one single cover of Aladdin Sane. So how can we prove this, or how can we show this? Well, we can show it by kind of taking converging evidence from a number of different sources. 
So the first thing we need to ask was, was the person, David Bowie, who created this image, were they familiar with comic book visual language? Were they aware of it? Because it makes it much more likely that if somebody is going to make a contribution to comic book visual language, it's going to be because they're aware of comic book visual language. They have some, uh, some knowledge of comic book visual language. It's really hard to make a contribution to an area that you are completely unaware of. So was he familiar with comic book visual language? Well, that is easy enough to show because uh, the what traveling exhibit David Bowie is actually contained a list of David, Bowie, uh, David Bowie's 100 top books of all time, his 100 favorite books of all time. And among that list were three uh, comic books. So on that list, they had the comic book Beano, which I believe is what he's reading uh, right there. They had uh, Octo Brianna and the Russian Underground. And then they also had a magazine called The Private Eye, whose covers and uh, political cartoons often use uh, comic book language. So it is definitely uh, clear that he was aware, very familiar with, having read many, many comics, uh, at least three of them, in his top 100. All right, so he was familiar with comic book language. The next piece of the puzzle, we know that David Bowie might have made a contribution with his image, but would that contribution have been heard? Are comic book artists influenced by uh, covers of, uh, of um, uh, cover albums, of musical album art? Thank you. Are they influenced by this musical album art? And again, that's just an existence proof. That's pretty easy to show. So for example, here we have the cover to the Elementals. And does anybody know the cover that this was taken from, the album that it was taken from? This is from Abbey Road by the Beatles. So an artist saw this and was inspired to recreate it in comic book form. And then we have this cover for the Astonishing uh, Spider-Man, and that is a recreation of Band on the Run from Paul McCartney and Wings. And then, very, uh, uh, very appropriate, we have this one from uh, Mad Men, which is uh, Mike Allred is the artist, and clearly a influence, uh, was influenced by the cover of Aladdin Singh. So it is definitely the case that artists have looked to music album art as inspiration, so we do have the potential for that influence to go in that direction. All right, so now the big question. Is close-up eye asymmetry actually due to Aladdin Sane? Is it actually due to this one image? And this one, we're gonna have two pieces of converging evidence to, uh, to answer that question. So the first one, line number one, is gonna take into account developmental uh, psychology and the development of art um, uh, artistic ability. So the first thing that we're going to take a look at is the release date of Aladdin Sane. Then we're going to take a look at to the extent with which David Bowie's work was part of American culture. Did anybody even know about David Bowie at that time when Aladdin Sane was released? Because if nobody knew who he was and nobody experienced this image, he wouldn't be able to make it part of language. And then we're going to take a look at the stages of artistic development. And we're going to take a look at the ages at which artists typically experience their peak creativity. And all this together is going to come up with our first line of evidence that points to Aladdin Sane being the image that introduced QA to comic book visual language. So let's start it off with the first part, the release date. So the release date for Aladdin Sane was uh, April 1973. So April 1973, this image gets released to the world. Did he have, did David Bowie have any sort of influence in popular culture at that time? We can argue that yes, he did, because this was his sixth studio album, and three of his previous ones peaked in the Billboard Top 40. Uh, Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars, a 1973 documentary. It had a 60-minute version broadcast on ABC TV back in 1974, and this was when there were only three channels to watch on TV, so a third of America probably watched this. And uh, so definitely he had impact. So then what about artistic development? So we got Bowie coming out at, uh, Alan Singh coming out in 1973. 
We definitely have him part of American culture. What about artistic development? Well, as it turns out, around the ages of 9 to 13, when you are developing artistically, around the ages of 9 and 13, developing artists are most open to influences from outside sources. This is a critical period where they are very uh, open and susceptible and vulnerable to outside sources, uh, influences that can set their trajectory for the rest of their artistic development. So 9 to 13 is that special critical age. And you can have a crystallizing experience is what they call it, where they can set the developmental course for an artist. So something you experience between the ages of 9 and 13 can set your creative path for the rest of your creative life. All right, and then the last piece is that artists actually reach their creative output at approximately 29.1 years of age. And that was a really interesting study done by Galvinson where they took a look at when did, they, when did artists make their most influential work? When did they get their first solo New York show? Uh, out of all the pictures that are in textbooks, from what period of their life are these pictures drawn? And it turns out they're pretty much from their early 20s until their late 30s. That's their creative, uh, peak creative output. So we have these following pieces. A child that was between 9 to 13 years old when Aladdin Sane was released. If you were 9 to 13 in 1973, you would reach your peak creative output 15 to 19 years later when you're approximately 29 years old. In other words, that creative peak is going to, expect to uh, be expected to occur in the 1990s. So if you are influenced by this, uh, by this artwork, then in the 1990s, that's when that influence should start to show. That's when these artists would have their biggest impact. And if you take a look at the artists who had the biggest impact, if you take a look at the artists who were the ones using Q uh, close-up asymmetry and had the most successful prolific careers in the 90s, and you take a look at their ages, it matches up with that analysis. So Rob Liefeld was a little young when, when uh, Latin Sane was released, five, uh, five and a half years, but his age in the 90s was 22 to 32 years old, and he used close-up eye asymmetry a lot in his artwork. Another giant, uh, Adam Hughes, six years old, 22 to 32 years in the 90s. Uh, Jim Lee, uh, nine years old in 1973, 25 to 25 years, so, sorry, 35 years in the 90s, once again, close up, eye asymmetry. There's nothing about Superman's heat vision where there shouldn't be something coming out on this side either. Definitely a choice by the artist. We have another close up eye asymmetry here on Spawn from Todd McFarlane, 12 years in 1973, 23 to 28 years in the 90s. And just example after example after example of close up eye asymmetry being used and all of the numbers fit and it exploded in its use in the 1990s, and most of the big, big artists of the 90s were the ones that were using that close-up eye asymmetry. All right, so that is line one uh, evidence uh, pointing to the fact that it was a Latin saying all those uh, years just line up with what we know about developmental and artistic development. However, there is a second line of, uh, of argument that has to do with drawing schemas. It has to do with drawing heuristics and how people draw things in order to communicate in comic book visual language. So this is an example of a drawing schema. So uh, Carmine Infantino, this is a very famous page of his, where he would teach you how to draw the flash. So if you are a young kid and you're an aspiring comic book artist, this was page two of a step-by-step -step, uh, a spread where he was like, oh, start with this, do this, add this. And this became part of the schema for drawing the flash. You would draw the flash, you would use multiple images, you would use action lines, uh, and that's what you would do when you draw the flash. So what we can do is we can analyze these drawing schemas, and the argument goes that if the cover of Aladdin Sane is actually responsible for the adoption of uh, QA into comic book visual language, then anybody that had an established graphic schema, any character that had an established way of drawing themselves, when Aladdin Sane was released, 
should be more resistant to being drawn with close-up eye asymmetry than a character that was developed after Aladdin Sane was released. So basically, if you already had a tradition of how you were drawn when this new influence came in, you should be, those characters should be more resistant to adopting that metaphor than characters that were created after that metaphor was introduced. So once again, we have Aladdin Sane, 1973. That was the release date. And what we did is we took a look at comic book covers and we coded whether or not they used close-up AI asymmetry. And we took a look at three established characters that came, that were developed much before 1973. So the first character was Superman, the next character was Batman, and then the final character was Wonder Woman. So we took a look at comic book covers from those three comics and saw if they used close-up eye asymmetry and how often did they use close-up eye asymmetry. We then also took a look at three popular characters from after 1973. So the first one, we did want to make this a little cross-cultural, so we chose uh, the, I believe at the time, most popular Japanese manga of all time. This is Gogo, uh, Golgo 13. And then we also took a look at uh, The Punisher, and uh, finally we took a look at Wolverine. So these were all created after 1973. All right, so the analysis, the data. We have publication date down here, January 1959, all the way up to uh, the end of uh, the 90s right there. And then here we have a cumulative frequency for how often close-up asymmetry, I asymmetry was used in the publication of these comics. So here we have the, uh, the uh, release of Aladdin Sane. And if you take a look at how often close-up eye asymmetry was used in Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman comics, you would have this cumulative frequency. So you can see that no QA for a long time, and then a couple of instances, but a very slow rise and a very steady increase. Uh, it does use close-up eye asymmetry, but you can see that it's a very, very steady increase. And importantly, you can see that it is nowhere near the amount of use of close-up eye asymmetry that we found in characters that were developed after Aladdin Sane. So Golgo, uh, Punisher, and uh, Wolverine, you can see that way more use of QA in their characters because their graphic schemas were new so they could incorporate this metaphor whereas these graphic schemas were established and were more resistant to the incorporation of that metaphor. And also interestingly right here, you can see that explosion in the use of close-up asymmetry. And when does it occur? It occurs in the 90s when those artists reached their peak age. And that difference is significant. All right, so those are the two lines of evidence uh, that argue that uh, this comic book, uh, uh, sorry, close-up asymmetry is actually due to uh, the uh, release of Aladdin Sane. So the fact that this metaphor became a part of uh, comic book uh, language can be traced back uh, and argument made that it was due to this one image this is where it all started all right so that is the article so what we're going to do right now is we're going to uh, spend some time on uh, some discussion questions so we got three discussion questions we'll do them one at a time so uh, <laughs> Thoughts, ideas on whether uh, close-up eye asymmetry is necessarily only a part of comic book visual language. Any thoughts on that? This is the part of the presentation where you guys would jump in and say things so you're like... you're asking if it's only in comic books? Yes. No. So, why would you say no? Movie posters. Okay, so movie posters, photography, album covers. Any other ideas or insights? I would be surprised if it's in art, but I don't have any specific Okay. So I would totally agree. I mean, there is nothing about it that restricts it to comic book visual language. It is a visual metaphor that can be used in any medium, uh, but it is way easier to track in comic books because they do have that regular publication date and they do have so many uh, instances. 
All right, so would uh, close-up by asymmetry be cross-cultural or cultural specific? So should we find this uh, image being used as a metaphor in other cultures? Um, or is it more specific to our culture? And uh, would it be, maybe uh, even a follow-up question, would it be dependent upon your interaction with the image of Aladdin Singh? Mm -hmm. I would say it's used in select cultures, but probably for different reasons. Like maybe, I would, when, I would say like maybe in ancient Egypt, they kind of use like half of their face, but like for different reasons, like for more like religious, spiritual reasons. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you would say that the the, uh, the metaphorical device would be used, but it would be communicated something else. It's more abstract. Okay. Like for different reasons, though. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of like in our culture, if I said John had a heart of stone, it might mean that he's cold and emotionless. But in another culture, if I say John has a heart of stone, it might mean he's really determined. Yeah, right? So now, it's still a metaphor, but it's not... It's, yeah, so they, okay. they probably, yeah, they do it in other cultures. And I can't think of any other examples, but mm -hmm. it's the same thing, but just for different reasons. Cool. Any other thoughts or ideas about that? Mm -hmm. I mean, if we're going to say that um, it would be because of David Bowie, places that didn't have access to his music, so um, maybe like North Korea, for example, might not have access to um, those kind of visual visuals the same as us, so mm -hmm. therefore they wouldn't have that metaphor. Um, that's not to say that other places like in China or Japan that are kind of nearby wouldn't have the same metaphor um, as we would read it. Yeah. Any other thoughts? And I would think that like it would just be slower. So because as it becomes a part of culture and as more things are produced with um, that, I think that it gets adapted into especially art forms and communication. Um, but it, like I, like if you weren't exposed during that period, during that crystallized experience, I would imagine that it would be it wouldn't have been with a boom that you saw it would have been afterwards. Mm -hmm. All right. So this is actually a, a really um, kind of insightful uh, observations because, and it kind of gets to the heart at one of the challenges of uh, understanding metaphors, because one of the one of the interesting things about a lot of metaphors is that they're rooted in universal experiences. So, for example, this one, close-up eye asymmetry. The idea of asymmetry being unnatural, being um, uh, alien. That is rooted in just about every single culture, and that comes from, or the argument is that it comes from natural experience. So most things in our world have bilateral symmetry, and it's only the weird, some weird animals like that, uh, I don't know, the fiddler's crab, you know that crab's got the one small hand, but it's got that big, huge, you know, uh, claw on the other one. There's very few examples of that. So. What feels natural to most people because that's the nature that they experience is asymmetry. So on the one hand, we would expect the asymmetry part of it to sort of be a universally understood metaphor. But then on the other hand, what does close up mean? Right, like what does close up mean to different cultures? So for our culture, it means that somebody is like us. For another culture, it might mean that somebody's aggressive, right? It could mean different things. So it's a very interesting idea to think about what would it mean and would it spontaneously develop in different, uh, in different cultures? So I once, I once saw a documentary where they mentioned that the, uh, the bow and arrow was spontaneously discovered, I think, on every single continent except Australia. I think Australia is the only one but they didn't come up with the bow and arrow, and it came up independently. People independently came up with this idea. So who knows, the light bulb above the head? That could have been invented by 20 different people in 20 different cultures who just said to themselves, I think that really works, and had no experience with each other whatsoever. All right, and then this last one, I think we already kind of touched on this a little bit, but uh, other popular images that might have been ground zero for a visual metaphor? Any ideas, anything come to mind? Or possible uh, new images that might be future uh, metaphors? Mm hmm um, Yep. I would 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Abbey Road definitely has been uh, reproduced and, and remixed uh, over and over and over again. And when, that's does, when that does happen, it's always interesting because in a lot of images that we experience, and a lot of images that we have, they're very popular and people keep talking about them and people keep mentioning things about them. And it's one thing to say that they do that because it's a great image, it's a, it's a great piece of art. But at the same time, they go beyond just the aesthetics of the art. So uh, the Mona Lisa is a perfect example of this. The Mona Lisa is the world's most famous painting. But is it really that much greater than any of the other paintings that is more famous, right? Is that one picture of that woman just so much better than anything else that it's, it's that most popular? Well, the answer, the answer is no. There's tons of pictures out there, tons of paintings that look just as great as the Mona Lisa, but there's something about it, maybe something that they're communicating, maybe some sort of metaphor that people are experiencing that she uh, that propels her to that kind of uh, height. So it would be interesting to kind of take a look at uh, other images and see if they could communicate something, especially ones that are just repeated over and over and over again. So things like the scream, which is just parody all over the place, or things like uh, uh, nude descending a staircase is a big one uh, that people do over and over again. Uh, it would be interesting to see that. All right, so any other questions, comments, before we wrap this up? Okay, so that was an example of the student presentation. I went a little bit over time. You do not have to go into that much detail, and I broke one of my rules, but uh, we'll get to the rules right now. So that's what we're going to try to do for uh, the next series of weeks. So we are going to have up to three presentations per day. They'll take 20 minutes each. Uh, that includes time for question. So that'll take about the hour with a little bit of intro, a little bit of outro. Uh, but that's what we're gonna be doing for the next series of weeks. We're gonna be doing student presentations. So what we're gonna turn to right now to end today's class is uh, to give you the information about what it is that I expect uh, for these presentations. So we're gonna take a look at, oh, forgot to animate that. We're gonna take a look at uh, the presentation info, number one, why are we doing original articles? Uh, number two, how do you need to present? Discussion questions like for the presentation. And then we're gonna take a look at presentation criteria. So uh, what, what to present, what not to present, the idea of one conclusion uh, and how to control the information. And then just some presentation tips. And then we'll talk about the date selection procedure, which I see some of you have already submitted. All right, and all of this, uh, I'll bring up this graphic. Uh, constantly just to kind of remind us of where we are on our journey so once again we're starting I'm assuming with a little bit more than nothing we are going to get to that uh, published article or that published chapter those are the uh, road uh, markers along the way and uh, right now we're right here we're right here in this kind of early section where we're going to be sharing our common knowledge all right so presentation info so it's going to be an original research article. That is the topic that you need to present on. So if you find an article, does being attractive always help positive and negative effects of attractiveness on social decision making? If you find that article and you're researching in that area of the perception of attractiveness and uh, you say to yourself, yeah, this is a really interesting article. I want to tell the class about it. This is what your presentation is on. If you have an article, Judgment of Contingency in Depressed and Non-Depressed Students, Sadder But Wiser, again, uh, if that's what you want to present on, if it's part of your project, the presentation will be on this. So it has to be an original research article uh, that you're going to be using. So uh, don't choose, you can definitely use other sources for your research work. And I want to encourage you to go outside of traditional sources when you're doing your work. So for example, my publication on, on uh, close-up AI asymmetry uh, used as a reference uh, an art exhibit, a traveling art exhibit on the life of David Bowie. So it doesn't have to be for your project, it doesn't have to be strictly academic journals, but for this presentation, it does have to be strictly academic journals. So we, you do need some academic journals 
in your final project. Don't limit yourself to them, but that's what you're doing for this particular presentation. All right, so the reason that we're going to the original journals and the reason that you are not allowed to use secondary sources, so you're not allowed to use like a magazine article, an online uh, report. So oftentimes you'll see those articles pop up where they're like, oh, scientists have shown that uh, you know sleeping less than seven hours a day can lead to Alzheimer's later in life. And you click on it and it's an article that was written for popular media where they say, oh, researchers at Duke University have found this, this, and this. If that's what you're interested in, you need to go to the original article that is being reported. So you need to find the original facts. And the reason for that is because, especially in this day and age, uh, we've heard about fake news. Uh, there is spin, there is bias, there is tons of reinterpretations. And we as psychologists, we need to go to the source. We need to go to the original findings and we need to present on those original findings. So definitely use Google, definitely use Psychology Today, definitely use any source to find your information. But when you find something interesting, when you find something and you think to yourself, oh, this looks like it might be really helpful for my project, read through the article, find what it is that they're talking about, and go to the original published research. Because if you go here, you're getting it straight from the author. If you go to any other source, you're getting what that person thinks the author said. Or you're getting what that person wants to promote from that author. So I, I was just having this discussion today. There was an article uh, that was published on uh, driving and the, uh, the gender differences in driving. And the results of the article, what the article said, was that when it comes to parking, men tend to take less time to park, but women tend to park more accurately. So if you measure in between the lines, women will get their car more in between the lines than males, but males will park much more quickly than females. And just about every article that I read spun that with the idea that uh, women are better drivers than men. Literally every title said, you know, contrary to popular belief, you know, don't believe what you were told, uh, shocker, women are better drivers than men. Science says that women are better drivers than men. And that's true, partially. If you go to the original research, you find out what the real case is. If you go to those popular articles, you get a lot of spin and you get a lot of bias. So don't let, uh, don't let your research project fall under, those, uh, under that danger. Don't let somebody else tell you what an article means. Go to the original and present on that. All right, so how do you need to present? Uh, you need to present using PowerPoint. It's got to be uh, something visual. If you don't have PowerPoint, you can use other presentation software so that there's, there's Prezi or there's something else, but it has to be something like this where you can have visuals on a screen and you can uh, stand in front of it and say, hey, take a look at this. So PowerPoint is the one that I use. You can use it if you can, but any presentation software uh, will work for this. Um, and uh, just make sure that you have the file ready to go. And what we're going to do is I'm going to log into the computer before the beginning of class and then all three presenters for that day will come up and they'll bring up their files. So make sure that your files will be accessible. If you need it on a USB drive, have it on a USB drive. If you need to sign into a website to access it, make sure that you can sign into a website to access it. Um, but just know that uh, I will be signing in under my username, which means some of the network drives, like your personal one, will probably not be available. So just try to make sure that you do have that um, access ready to go. And uh, if, uh, if you can, upload your presentation to Canvas prior, and I will be able to open it up uh, from the Canvas account. But uh, definitely it has to be some sort of visual presentation uh, software. All right, and then the last uh, kind of piece of presentation info is the discussion, the discussion questions. So these are going to be questions that you're going to provide your audience uh, so that you can uh, think about them during your discussion. And then we're going to discuss them at the end of the discussion. So these will be submitted before your presentation. And I'll pop these up on Canvas so that we can share them with the class before you delve into. So make sure that before each day's presentation, you just take a quick look at the discussion questions for that day. 
All right, so presentation criteria. So for your individual presentations. Number one, what do you need to present and what do you not want to present? So the one thing that's gonna help you a lot, we need to keep this about 15 minutes long with about five minutes left for discussion. So what you wanna do is you want to choose one conclusion, one idea, one major point, maybe two at most, but one conclusion that you're gonna to present to your audience, one takeaway point. So you might be sitting on a gold mine of an article that has five experiments that goes through an entire series that is just the most fascinating thing in the world. That's great when you have hours to sit down and read it. Not so good when you got 15 minutes to tell people about the work. So go through that article and say, you know what? They showed these 12 things, but I think this one thing is the one thing people need to know. This one point, this one finding, this one conclusion is the big one, is the important one. And you choose it, and that's what your presentation is gonna center around, right? So it, it actually, it's a lot less work for a lot of articles because you're not presenting on the entire thing. It's not a summary of the article. It's what's the main thing I want people to know about this article, and then what do I need to present to get them there? So one conclusion, two at most, what you're not going to present, every single conclusion, every implication, every ramification, every consequence, that's too much. Uh, if you had an hour and 15 minutes, maybe you'd have that time. In 20 minutes, it just can't be done. So when you're reading your articles, it's up to you as the critical thinking reader. Pick what you think is the most important thing from that article, and that's what you're going to present on. All right, so what to present? You're going to present a synopsis of the article. Uh, what you're not going to present is the whole article. So once you pick your one conclusion, then what you're, gonna, uh, what you're going to um, present is a synopsis that you need to understand that one conclusion, right? So you can pick what do you need to show from the article in order to make your audience understand how we got to that one conclusion. You're definitely not presenting the entire article, which means that you're gonna present the necessary background theories. You're not gonna present all the theories, right? You don't have to go through every single theory that they talk about, just the ones that are needed for your one conclusion. And you're gonna talk about general methods for the experiments, usually there'll be experimental articles, uh, and that would include subjects in this case, but you don't need to present every single detail of the methods. So you can say things like, oh, in, in experiment number one, they divided their subjects into two groups. One group was shown pictures, the other group was shown uh, verbal instructions, and then they measured response times to see who understood the information the fastest. That's a nice synopsis of the general method. What you wouldn't want to say is, well, they split them into two groups, they used randomization. Uh, what they did is they uh, had a random number generator that they consulted, and when every single subject came in, they were given a random number, and if it was an even number, they were in group one, but if it was an odd number, they were in group two. And then group one, they had uh, pictures that they showed them. And these pictures came from the Feynman Pictures database and they were gamma corrected, so it's too much, right? It's great in an article where you can sit there and say, oh, this is great if I ever want to reproduce this. Just general methods. However, I do want you to include subjects because this is gonna really help us in our diversity aspect of this. This is gonna tell us who does this experiment work for? Who does this experiment apply to? Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to find out you know, the, the, the application of these to a diverse uh, group of subjects. So it's important to know, was it all females? Was it all males? Were they all young adults? Were they all children? Uh, did they have any learning disabilities? Did they have any sort of you know, pre-existing uh, characteristics? So in your general method, you're not going to go into detail about a lot of things, but you do want to say, you know, there was 100 subjects, 70 of them were male, uh, 30 of them were female, average age, you know, 22 uh, years old. Give the characteristics like that and it'll help you later on when you're applying that to your diverse group. All right, and the discussion questions, you're going to provide those uh, and they're related to your one conclusion. So whatever your one conclusion was, try to think of discussion questions that you can launch off of that to kind of um, open up the floor 
and uh, get some ideas uh, flying around. All right, any questions so far about anything about what will be expected? All right, uh, length of the presentation. This one is easy, 20 minutes. You got 20 minutes total, and that includes uh, time for questions. So uh, I would say shoot for about 12 to 15 minutes of actual you standing up and talking time, and then that will leave us with uh, enough time for discussion. Uh, on that note, uh, the goals that you're trying to do is you're trying to share knowledge with your fellow uh, colleagues here, with your fellow senior seminar researchers, and you're trying to present one conclusion. You have one takeaway point, and you need to prevent, pre present certain pieces of information to get to that one takeaway point. Occasionally, you're gonna do your presentation, you're gonna try it out, and you're gonna find that it takes 25 minutes. In that case, you gotta take stuff out. You just have to, it's part of the criteria. We need to get it down so that it's 20 minutes all in with discussion questions. On the other hand, sometimes you're gonna find that you do all the criteria, you satisfy everything, and you only got eight minutes, right? It's an eight minute presentation. That is 100% fine. Do not worry about going under. Don't pad your presentation because you went under. Hit everything, you know, show, give the, give the background and the relevant theories, give the general method, include the subjects, include the one point, the one conclusion uh, that, they, that they arrived at, give a good synopsis of it so that people can understand what that one conclusion was. And if it, if it happens in eight to 10 minutes, Great, do it. Uh, you're not gonna lose any points or anything on that. Uh, we'll have more time for discussion, and if not, we'll, we'll all get out of here a little bit earlier. So don't, don't pad the time, but just be aware that you got 20 minutes, and I will cut you off at the end of it, so uh, make sure that you got that in, in under that time. All right, other presentation uh, criteria. Okay, so presenting information, controlling the information. All right, so there is a ton of studies that show that people are very visual. All right, people are extremely uh, visual in their uh, consumption of information. People are visual in their understanding of information. And another thing is that people can only concentrate on one thing, right? People, that idea of multitasking is a myth. Uh, and I see some hands coming up, thank you very much because all of you have gotten down to here who are putting up your hands. And probably some of you are wondering, does he really want us to do this? Yes, I do want you to do this. <laughs> this slide here is to prove a point. You need to control the information that goes on the screen. Because while I was talking about multitasking, most of you, you know, and you can be honest, this was the point of this slide, most of you were not listening to me talking about multitasking. Most of you are down here going, oh, reading is a very practice skill, so much that it has become automated. And when I'm talking about multitasking as a myth, you're not paying attention to me. You're, getting, you're saying, for real, raise your hand as soon as you read this. And then all of the stuff that I was talking about here, it's gone. Because you were sitting there going, does he really want us to raise his hand? Am I supposed <laughs> to raise my hand? So you weren't, you weren't paying attention. And it's not your fault, right? Reading is very practiced. Try, try not to read something, it's almost impossible. Right? I'm just looking around right now. France, uh, college, uh, northern face. I mean, it's hard, Nike. It's hard. You can't stop yourself from reading. So um, don't, don't let your audience do this. You need to control the information. And I'm going to be looking for this in your presentations. So a better way to do this would be to say, do something like this one over here, where you would say, all right, let's talk about presentation criteria. You need to control your information. Now I have your attention, because you got nothing else to do, except listen to the person that's talking. You need to control your information. Why? Studies show that people are very visual. And let me tell you a little bit about what those studies were about and how people are visual. And then I can say, you know, people can only concentrate on one thing at a time. People think you can multitask. Well, guess what? Multitasking is a myth, right? And now everybody's with me, and everybody's on where I am. And what I've seen in presentation after presentation is when you put up too much information, you lose your audience. They start reading ahead. 
And then any points you try to make about information up here is lost on them. And when you get later on into your presentation and you said, all right, now it's very critical that we remember that multitasking is a myth. Remember what I said about that? And everybody in their mind is like, oh no, I don't because I wasn't really paying attention. It's just the way your mind works. Use the animations in the presentations to control the information. You need to do that in order to have an effective presentation. So you saw that in the, um, in the example presentation. Even for the images, I would bring up one image and then another image and then another image. For the graph, I brought up a blank graph. Then you got one line, then you got another line. Make sure that you're doing that as much as possible and develop your animation skills in order to control that uh, information. All right, and then uh, I think this is the final presentation tip uh, that I have. It is very helpful and it'll get your uh, audience on board right away if you can just start with a quick example. So if you can, and this doesn't have to be from your article, but your article is gonna be about something. It's gonna be about some phenomenon. It's gonna be about some sort of idea or behavior. And if you can start off with a quick example of that, it, it just brings your audience on board. So when I do presentations on visual metaphors, one of the first things that I show them are the following four slides where I can, I, and I tell them, look, a picture can be literal. The grass is green. This is literally a picture of the grass is green. But it can also be metaphorical. He has a heart of stone. And you can use metaphoricals like here, like he's actually, his typewriter's not on fire. It's just that the ideas are coming out of it, you know, like fire. And this is not triplets. This is one person falling at just three stages. That's a metaphor to show the, the motion of falling. That is way better than just sitting there and talking about it or launching into visual metaphor theories. You show one example or two examples, everybody will be nodding their heads going, oh, I get it. Oh, visual metaphors, I get it. And then you can launch into the rest of it. So start with a real quick example. Here's an example of the phenomenon that we're talking about. And then that will uh, bring everybody on board, uh, get your audience ready uh, for the technical stuff that will be coming uh, after that example. All right, and then the last presentation tip, and uh, this one, as much as you can, um, you want to use graphics. Uh, if your article has figures, use figures to explain the results of your article. If your article has images of the stimuli that they used, use images of the stimuli uh, in your presentation as well. Use as many graphics as you possibly can because they just, I mean, my work is on how much information they can convey and, um, and uh, produce, and it's just way better. So it is much better to stand in front of something like this and say, all right, we're gonna talk about fake news and how fake news and the spread of information and misinformation is a huge issue rather than something like this. Oh yeah, fake news is a problem. This is impactful and people will remember. This is forgetful and people will start checking their phones, right? So try to use as many graphics as you can because the impact of it is just much more, uh, much more extreme. And uh, also, it'll stop you, if you're new to this, it'll stop you from reading directly off the slides. So if I pop this up, I got nothing to do except talk about fake news and how fake news is an issue. If I pop this up, again, we're automatic readers, you'll find yourself falling into a tendency of going, okay, so um, fake news is a problem, dot, dot, dot. You know, let me tell you about that. It's, you'll read off the slides. It's not a good thing to get into. Uh, use your graphics as much as you can. All right, so that is it for what you're expected to do in your presentations. The graphics one, just so that you know, that's a tip. Uh, try to do it if you can. The more graphics you have, the more effective your presentations will be. But I do understand that for some of your projects, you might not have any graphs or figures or anything like that in your uh, thing. So don't, don't feel like you have to force graphics into it. I prefer, I very much like a visual style presenting, but uh, definitely if you can do it, but uh, you know, don't start shoehorning you know, images in just for the sake of saying, oh, I have, I have graphics, let me tick off that box. 
make sure that they have a point. Make sure that they are communicating uh, something that you want to communicate. All right, any questions on the presentation before we get to the data selection procedure? Okay, so let's wrap up this uh, uh, today. So the, uh, the presentations are going to occur during work the weeks uh, two through nine. And uh, we have, we're going to have open times in those, uh, in those weeks. So we needed about, uh, we needed 36 slots for presentations. And I believe across those uh, weeks, we're going to have uh, 48. So we're gonna have open slots, and during those open times is when I'm gonna present some uh, information that you need to know for the, you know, to uh, continue on in the course. So over the next coming weeks, we're gonna have students presenting, and then any time remaining, I'll be like, okay, so this is what you wanna do for your visual draft. This is what we're gonna do next for you know, this stage. So it's gonna be intermixed, but that's what we're gonna be doing over the next uh, few uh, series of weeks, one well, weeks two to nine. And um, we got space for three per meeting. And in Canvas Assignments Date Selection Procedure, you can find an Excel sheet. And what I want you to do is I want you to put your preferred times into that Excel sheet and then submit those that completed Excel sheet. So the sheet that you're looking for is that guy right there, all right? So we have week two, that is the week that is just coming up, all right? Week three, week four, week five, that's block number one. And then we got six, nine, uh, six seven, eight, and nine, that's block number two. You are gonna do one presentation in block number one and then another presentation in block number two. So it's spread out. So what I want you to do is out of these eight slots, put a number one where on the date you most prefer. Put a number two on your next preferred date. Put a number three on your next preferred date. You know, check your schedule. Make sure that you uh, kind of accommodate yourself if you, you know, have a busy week that week. Maybe put that at number eight. And then here as well, from one to eight, right? What's your most preferred? What's your least preferred? And then what I'm gonna do is, uh, everybody, there's a deadline for the assignment. I believe it's Friday at uh, 2 p.m. So tomorrow by 2 p.m. Just make sure that you um, that you complete those because what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all of those and I'm going to finalize the syllabus with your presentation times and the dates are going to appear in the updated syllabus. And what I'm going to do just to keep this fair, I'm going to conduct a draft lottery to assign, to assign the dates. So I am literally going to put everybody's name into a random number generator and whoever gets the lowest random number, I'm gonna take a look at their preferred date and say they get their number one. Whoever is number two, they get their number one, unless it conflicts with the first person's number one, in which case they get their number two. And then I'm gonna keep going on until we fill that first block. And then what I'm gonna do is whoever got picked last in block number one is gonna go first in block number two, just so that we're gonna to try to spread out who gets their preferred dates and who gets who doesn't get their preferred dates. So there are spaces, there are a lot of spaces available. I am completely, I would be uh, very surprised, I, I'm not against it, but I'll be very surprised if anybody chooses this coming Tuesday as their preferred uh, presentation date. But that's just me, I don't know, you might wanna say, I just wanna get it over with and let's do that first one and rip it off like a Band-Aid, whatever it is. But we do have space, all right, so it's not as if you know, we got three people per day, six people per week. There's a ton of space in there, but make sure that you do um, submit that uh, and get it in on time. Uh, if you get it in on time, you're into the lottery. If you get it in late, then you get whatever is left over. And uh, if you don't get it in at all by, uh, um, I'm, I'm gonna try to put this together by Friday night. Uh, if you don't get it in by that time, I'll choose a presentation time for you. I'm fine with that as well. So make sure that you get those in just so that we can work around your schedules. Any final questions about uh, what's coming up in the next few weeks? All right, so that is it for uh, today's class. So as we're going through this period, just as a sort of uh, before you go, as we're going through this period, um, this is going to be the period of the senior seminar 
where there is a light production schedule. And what I mean by that is that you're really not gonna be handing in a lot of work during this initial phase of time. And that's by design, because what that does is it leaves you a lot of time for you to go out and do the research, for you to go out and find your sources, to read those uh, articles, to find your background theories and your background ideas. So make sure that you are spending your time doing that, investing that time right now, because uh, while it's sort of light on the things that you need to submit at this point, you do want to make sure that you are starting to collect those articles, those PDFs, uh, so that you're uh, moving your research project along uh, and giving it the time that it'll need. All right, other than that, uh, if there's no more questions, we are done for today.